Sahana Bhavatu, Sahano Bhavatu, Saviriam Karavahi, Tejas Vinavadu Pramastamadu Vishavahai, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. May he protect us both, may he nourish us, may he give us vigor and strength to take care of our studies, give us illumination and affair, may we not cavil, and peace, peace, peace be unto us. Salutations to Lord Krishna, son of Vasudev, the light of Devaki, and who is the law, law, the destroyer of lust and greed and all other demons, including Kamsha, and glory to that entity who is the full Godhead, who came to us to teach us this Srimad Bhagavad Gita. So we are Today, concluding the sixth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita on Jnana Yoga, Yoga of Meditation. As usual, we want to invite some questions. Last week you said that uh, the whole of Bhagavad Gita is divided into three parts, six chapters each. What is the significance of this division into three parts? So the first part really deals with the most urgent and practical need that we have, that is to try and deal with the struggle of our normal activities. So the emphasis is on what we call karma yoga activity. Even that is a prerequisite to this very last section of it on meditation. But then from there we go into the idea of finding out what is the Is there a, a devotional aspect to this? How do we relate to a personal God? Or how do we relate, relate to what we might say the heart? You can divide everything into hand, heart, and head. And then from the 13th chapter, the last six chapters are really dedicated to the philosophical portion, namely finding out what is the nature of nature itself. And in contradistinction to that, what is Purusha? And the second chapter and the 18th chapter are really summary chapters. One way that some people have of studying the Bhagavad Gita is to get to grips with the second chapter in a system that is used for lecturing today. Namely, tell what you're going to say, then say it, then tell what you have said. And that is why the second chapter and 18th chapter are the longest chapters in this whole discourse. So that by offering six chapters in a series, we have covered every aspect that we can think of and made it compatible with the various yogas or approaches or methods. So that all methods and all paths really are incorporated in this. Four of them the fourth, namely, Jnana Yoga, is what we're covering here now. But otherwise, we have to comprehensively deal with the fact that we are standing in a place, as it were, against a situation. And we have to find some practical formula that will give us peace of mind, a sense of equilibrium, a sense of hope, in dealing with all the practical issues and problems of this life. And there also has to be an idea of how does how do we practically relate to that and we have to also understand 
how are we in this vast cosmos and what is this all about? And with all of this equipment, we get some practical direction in life. So Sri Arjuna requires all of this because it's not easy to get out of a difficulty. And I think all of us acknowledge that. When we're in the midst of a situation where things seem to overwhelm us, we need as many pieces of equipment as we possibly can. So from, for example, the 13th chapter onwards, we find the idea that this whole situation that we have personalized is a field of activity and endeavor. But a most interesting thing is, a deeper analysis is, that the knower of this field of activity that we're involved in, of what we call the world and the cosmos and our small domestic environment, all of this is subject to one knower. And he has the knower in all the fields, says Krishna. Not just this central one. So we find as we progress through this Bhagavad Gita, there's scope for glorifying a sense of adoration, worship, and thankfulness. A scope for that in the second series of six chapters. You can say seven to twelve. And then from thirteen onwards to eighteen, we find, and what is the rest? What is this world that we are involved in? And how can we relate to it in a, in a broader sense and a deeper sense? So the Bhagavad Gita leads us progressively from where we stand now to what we can do about it to how can we engage our feelings and our sense of wonder in the whole universe, including the 11th chapter, which shows this great cosmic vision and to get a sense of realism about it. And then, because we prefer to dwell on things which are good and happy and pleasant, but life is not necessarily like that. The world has a mix. And then to go on from there to understand the deeper philosophical aspects of being an entity that can stand in a sense of, in a state of quiescence amidst all of the other goings on and to have some kind of philosophical approach in life. So all of this is necessary. And it doesn't matter what your propensity is. You'll pick up any direction from this. So we can pick up then the sixth chapter. And this will finish the chapter off. So a very important question came up because like all of us we are worried about two things. First thing we are worried about is all of this spiritual practice, where does it lead, lead us? Is it a good investment? If there is a, a question, an age-old question that is asked, asti, asti diege, nayama stiti J.K. says the Katha Upanishad, he asks an important question that everybody asks, and particularly in this day and age, is death the end? Some say that there is existence beyond the borders of this life. Others say that there is nothing. Today there is a great movement in the first world countries, developing world, towards materialistic atheism, to say, there doesn't seem to be anything more than this. And so there's a declaration that from that point of view, we have nothing to fear. And yet everybody has a fear. Everybody clings on at the end to this life. So what you say and what you really believe seem to be something separate. Same thing with people who do believe in God. 
I've come across people who doubt in the end, towards the end, they lose their faith. Because throughout their life, their experience hasn't been direct. It hasn't been real. It's just been a kind of theoretical religion, subscribing to certain teachings and doctrines and dogmas. Certain rules and regulations. Sri Ramakrishna working as a, worshipping at the Mulakali's temple was so unconventional and there were negative reports that came back. And Motu Babu, who was managing, he wanted to investigate for himself what is this strange, strange goings on in the Mulakali temple that stands in for worship. And what he found was something that moved his heart because he saw somebody who had a direct experience, who had a direct connection, who was expressing a sense of love and adoration. And he felt the purpose of this Dakshin Swara temple has actually been fulfilled. So there's nothing to complain about. The object of having a worship, a temple worship, or a place dedicated to that, is to worship, not to uh, do any kind of superficial activities. And this is covered in some of these stanzas here. The superiority of the yogi only above any other individual. For example, such as ascetics. The danger in asceticism is to focus on this physical body. Let me control this physical body. As soon as you say, let me control this body, your mind is focused on body. Or to those people who are focused on knowledge. Knowledge in the sense of, not deep wisdom, but in the sense of intellectual pursuits. Understanding the text of a scripture, but not the spirit of it. A mere assembly of facts. And then... Another type would be the ritualistic type who want to express their love but they get caught up in the pros and cons and technicalities of how you worship, what is orthodox, what is not orthodox. Anyway, Sri Krishna tells us just a leaf, a flower, some water. That's all that's required because it's the sincerity you think God requires flowers? He who made all the flowers, he will say, I'm very disappointed, I have no flowers today. It's not that God requires the flowers. We require the token of offering the flowers. It's our expression. That's the idea. So this whole idea of what is the afterlife, an important question, is there such a thing? Is there not? And if there's not, then if the doubt is there, then what's the point of all this effort if I didn't get an immediate result now? The ideal being so high, what happens if I fall short? These are some of the questions that go through Arjun's mind and no doubt all of our minds. And so the reply goes like this, Sri Bhagavan Vacha, Bhavta Neve Hana Mudra, Vinashas Tasya Vidyate. Neither in this world nor in the next is there destruction for him or for that person. He will evaluate things on the basis of uh, reward and punishment. It's a very early stage in our development, even our human development. Reward and punishment is a measure. Uh, and we want some kind of result from it. From good, we expect a good result. From bad, we expect some punishment. And so sometimes religion picks up this idea as a beginning stage, just to get you moving. If you do something good, then you get ice cream in heaven. And if you do something bad, then you go to the barbecue of hell, you being the object of the barbecue itself. So we don't want that. The idea of fear, fear and punishment and reward, these are offered. In the beginning, we offer these to a child. Until the child gets the understanding, I want to stand on my own two feet. I don't require a prod from outside. I can, everything can happen from inside. 
All my knowledge can happen from inside. All my effort can happen from inside. I don't require somebody to motivate me. I'm self-motivated. In that same way, we mature also in the religious or spiritual endeavor. And so, we're concerned with this world and we're concerned with the next world. And the idea of Vedic ritual really was to make prosperity and happiness and goodness in this world and also next world. <coughs> and so is there destruction for him who is not entirely good, who hasn't prepared well for this world and for the next world? Is it all wasted? But for the doer of good, no, we're completely assured there's no destruction for that person, for the honest, sincere person we go away from this idea, this dual evaluation of good and evil. And so, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, other things will be added unto thee, says Jesus. So if we seek that first, if we have a love of God, the author and creator of the entire universe, will our universe be bad? Yeah, of course it will be good. If we go to the source of purity and goodness, our world will be pure and good, automatically without seeking it. It just as a, it comes as a secondary spin-off. Unasked it comes. That's the thing. Never comes to grief. Durgatim, bad state of grief, that word is used. So, no grief. And this, uh, there are a number of synonymous terms we can use. So anybody who durgatim, bad state of grief, there are other terms. Uh, destruction is a, is a synonymous term given in the English translation here and all of these kinds of things. The doer of good never comes to grief is the emphasis in this passage. Sri Krishna says, a man gets his dessert in tune with his mental makeup. The Lord is the Kalpatru, the fabled desire fulfilling tree to the devotees. Philosophically, what happens is a mental movement occurs and the universe corresponds in line with it because even the universe is an expression of that cosmic mind which is operating. Some of this we went through last time. We're just reviewing. Prapya punya kritam lodam usitva shashvatiha. Shashvita Samaha Shuchinam Shri Matam Gehe Yoga Prashto Bihi Jayati Having attained to the worlds of the righteous and having lived there for countless years, he falls from Yoga. He who falls is reborn in the house of the pure and prosperous, or there's an alternative in the next stanza, that is, or one who is born in the family of wise yogis only. A birth like this, he says, is truly very difficult to obtain in this world. This requires some kind of commentary and explanation because all the Eastern religions, that is Jainism, Buddhism, Hinduism, have this idea of what we commonly call reincarnation. And we touched on this last week. You see, there's everything. If we observe the universe, we find it continuously reincarnating. We cannot deny reincarnation when we consider that your body as you sit here now is not the same as your body was two, three, four, five, six, seven years ago. There is a turnaround. And it's not just a repair system. It's a complete transformation, physical transformation. And the whole idea is that we see uh, the Taitiri Upanishad tells us about these various five sheaths, Panchakosha, that there are five sheaths, and we can condense all that really into the idea of three physical bodies, three bodies, not physical, but three bodies. One is physical. So but one is more subtle and one is more causal. And these correspond also to our waking state, our dream and dream sleep. And if it's true here and true in our environment, it's true everywhere, is a principle. And so we find that there is uh, naturally this, what we call Shula Sharira, the physical body, Shukshma Sharira, subtle body, corresponding to the mind. 
And then there's a Karana Sharira, that is a causal body, which takes place. Now, when we say that there is a physical death, is it a full stop or a comma? Is a question. It's the same question, the same doubt is being posed, really. Is it a full stop or a comma? Well, it's a comma, according to the philosophy, and also according to common sense. There is no example anywhere in the universe of death. There is only an example of transformation. You have some wood, you burn it in a fire. It doesn't go away, it doesn't disappear, it doesn't change into something entirely different, but that's a transformation of matter. And when you do a mass balance of it all, it adds up to the same thing. You take the ash, you take the smoke, you make a mass balance of that, you'll find exactly the same mass of the wood. It's just a transformation, just transformational change, that's all. Transformational causation. And so there's nothing new anywhere. A seed develops into a tree, the tree begets a seed, the cycle continues, it continues forevermore. And so we cannot find any example of a linear moment where there is a beginning, a lifespan, and a death. And we were discussing earlier the idea of this transmigration or reincarnation, which has now become much more popular in Western countries. But it was always there in the ancient worlds. How can we find some explanation when Jesus is asked and presented with a man who's blind from birth Sir, Rabbi, Master, was this man's condition caused by him or his parents? We are updated into modern terms. So if it was caused by him, well, he's blind from birth, it must have been from a preceding birth. So that was obviously accepted. Or is it the fault of his parents, is another way of saying, is it in the genetic makeup? Was it from the sins of the father, sins of the, the mother, all combined as XY chromosomes in our modern biological understanding and comes out as a blind person? Whose fault is it? Who shall we point the finger at for the blame? But Jesus very wisely answers, he's there to reveal all the glory of God and then the person gets healed. Because in the healing process we find the glory of that which transcends all these physical conditions and acts to demonstrate that there is something transcendent over birth, life and death and rebirth. Something remains static that never is reborn. And so when we say reincarnation, we're not talking of the essential entity, the divinity within, that entity that remains and is described here as Atman. We are not talking about that. We're not talking about the witness, knower, thinker behind all of the activities. We're talking about the activities themselves, the observable universe. And when we observe this whole range, we we'll touch briefly on a deeper philosophy that is expanded in the Upanishads very clearly in a number of the Upanishads, but is speciality subject for the Mandukya Upanishad. And that is the question of not just one state of consciousness or two, but three states of consciousness that comes from our own direct experience. We can't deny it. That there is a waking world that we take to be real and where we judge everything from, even the reality or unreality of a dream or a dreamless sleep. But there's also a dreamless sleep. And there's also a dream. These three worlds are there. We can say dream is a kind of intermittent stage between waking and sleep. We can say dream is sleep plus memory. The Patanjali Yoga Sutras brings this out as one of the five varieties of waves in the mind. So with all of this in mind, we find that what is operating now, we are conscious of a physical body with a mental makeup that comprises a conscious mind as well as an unconscious mind that we can label memory. Everything that goes in the conscious mind leaves its carbon copy in the memory section of the unconscious mind. And that unconscious mind is a, is a library deposit area. So that anything coming to the conscious mind creates many links and word associations that come out as impressions. 
we know nothing except what's in our memory, and the memory itself is gathered from our experience. So what is it that leaves? When somebody dies, we ask, where does that person go gone? Is the same question as, when a man sleeps, where did he go? And these Upanishads will, will provide questions and answers on both of these issues. Where does somebody go to? Well, doesn't didn't go anywhere. So it's a very subtle but very profound key study is the study of these states of consciousness. And that means that we carry baggage over. Just as if you were to take a taxi to the airport and the taxi breaks down, you engage another one, I mentioned before this example, and you transfer your baggage. I'm using the word baggage because that's a psychological term that psychologists use, that we have unconscious baggage. What's a psychologist's duty is to see if you can unpack your psychological baggage and see if we can deal with it. Probably by dwelling into the past moments and things like that, rightly or wrongly, that's their technique. To bring the baggage out. Well, the baggage is there. And we have to make sure our baggage is useful and good. Probably it's not. And this is what's carrying over. This is what is comprised of all the impressions which stop us which delay us on our overall journey toward freedom and perfection. And so that urge continues. We can say it's a whole assemblage of desires. The term vasanas came out the other night in a talk. So what are these vasanas? These are strong, strong, impelling desires that move us forward. We somehow seem to be flavored with them. We somehow seem to be infused with them. They are so much a part of our nature. But our true nature is deeper and more profound than this. And all the scriptures want to indicate this very deep nature, expressed in different terms, emphasized differently. But the message is exactly the same. And your own introspective analysis will bring out also, that beyond the field of this physical, something else must be there. A mind must be there, and a mind that is made up of such deep habitual impressions that we are helpless unless we do something, and we cannot do it directly. We have to do it through the conscious mind. So all spiritual endeavor and discipline is disciplining on the conscious level, first of all, developing an intention sustaining it, practice, don't forget, abhya, abhyaza, practice. Practice and vairagya is the dual method mentioned here. So what does practice mean? Once, twice? I don't think you can say that. And it has to be steady, steady practice, not just occasional. And this is the only way that we have. And in order to do this, we have to have a, develop a different outlook. So throughout the Bhagavad Gita, we are looking at things We are looking at things from the army assembling and throwing <laughs> trumpets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's one way of looking at it, isn't it? There are armies doing battle. There's a scene, a very dramatic scene. This is how the Bhagavad Gita begins, in this dramatic scene that is highlighted in Mahabharata. And all the events in the Mahabharata as an epic are leading up to this monumental battle, which in human memory is so devastating that all the military leaders and kings and royalty are all dispensed with. Such a memory in human history is there that this Mahabharata as a story is enduring. But we are beset with this. Even today in modern, in modern life, you see how many wars and difficulties are there around us. So many. But if every individual was to master the mind, 
That is the conscious mind. And in so doing, we shape the unconscious mind, the habitual mind, into a state of pristine clarity and purity. Then all of this would move forward. Swamiji, does nature give us skills um, precognitively through future events that might arise? Does, it, does nature prepare us for the future? Nature, what we call nature, and don't forget you're included in nature. So you can't be separate from nature. What we call nature is the whole of existence expressed as from Brahma to a clump of grass. That is, everything in our objective world is nature. And everything within these three states of consciousness is what we classify as nature. But you see, nature, and we'll find out later in later chapters, Nature is not necessarily different and separate. It looks like that. But the Vedanta philosophy comes to a final conclusion that says that nature and its source is one and the same thing. We know that in Vedanta, that Brahman, as we call it, the supreme principle, is both the material and efficient cause of everything. When it comes out through time and space and causality and function, we call this nature just appearing like that, like the sun rays expressing themselves through the cloud. And we can have a poetic understanding of it, you know, when we see a cloud at a certain time, and we can't exactly see the sun, we see this beautiful display of the rays of the sun shining from inside, shining out. If we have the understanding that the ray, that it coming from the sun, that the rays are not separate from it, and that the cloud itself is also part and parcel of it. You see, a transcendent position is like going above the clouds and witnessing there's no weather. But an imminent position is where we go below the power of clouds and see all the separateness. And our job in spiritual life, that is our sense of discernment, will be to take all that and see it is only just an expression of it. It is only just like a rainbow. It's a rainbow essentially is the sun seemingly split up into various colors of the spectrum with the inference also of infrared and ultraviolet unseen. So what is seen and unseen, both are reflected. Now, is there an intention within that nature that carries through and arrives at our substation called human, the human mind, knowing that with great faith all of the things that we have in nature are supplied by Mother Nature. The last commentary in Vivekananda's Raja Yoga is a beautiful commentary on nature. It's worth reading it. If you get the Raja Yoga on the shelf there, it's worth reading it. Because Swami Vivekananda was, was writing in an era where Darwin had just produced his Origin of the Species. And in that Origin of the Species, nature was seen to be something that tore things to pieces, something that was hostile, something that had to be thoroughly attacked and combated. He writes here in the last sutra, nature's task is done. This unselfish task which our sweet nurse, sweet nurse, something that's nurturing us and providing us with all of the necessary skills, including precognitive, if that's necessary, had imposed upon herself. She gently took the self-forgetting soul. What are we suffering from? Self-forgetfulness. By the hand, as it were, and showed him all the experiences in the universe, all manifestations, bringing him higher and higher through various bodies, till his lost glory came back and he remembered his own nature. This is reincarnation at its best. When we are exploring these last few stanzas here in this Bhagavad Gita, what are we seeing? This evolution of nature that's providing us with everything, as any mother would, not something biting, fighting, scratching. Not something that is rending everything apart, but something that is nurturing us. Because this is the same entity 
the expressive manifesting entity. So some few days back we were celebrating the Saraswati Puja. And we find there that Saraswati is also this nature. Saraswati is this flowing grace that we call nature that is also nurturing us and provide us with all. But where do we get a sense of precognition if not from maybe nature providing us with a previous life? So that by the age, by a certain age, all these inherent skills and talents come out. How is it that in the same family you have people of completely different personalities, even twins, identical twins, identical in their DNA structure, come out differently with different personalities, different skill sets, different likes and dislikes. And the argument of nature versus nurture comes up. How much is it now? Fortunately for us, studies on twins have been done and we know it's approximately 50% nature, 50% nurture. But what we call nature is previous life. What in the Bhagavad Gita is called guna, and the other, the nurturing aspect, is called karma. So what we saw called kar guna and karma is nothing more than our inherited tendency, <coughs> but not from parents, but from our own previous life is the idea. So we have to view things not in a linear sense, but in a circular sense. And we have to absolute faith that nature that provides all the problems seemingly also provides all the solutions. That faith has to be developed. We'll go on then. So she gently took the self-forgetting soul by the hand as it were and showed him all the experiences in the universe, all manifestations, bringing him higher and higher through various bodies. No effort is wasted. That's the point. No endeavor is wasted. And a person carries on with increased enthusiasm an increased effort in a family that is conducive toward it, either in a family that is pure and prosperous or in a family of yogis who are not necessarily rich but are providing such a rich environment for spiritual life. See, Narada is a, a, a character brought out time and time again in the Hindu mythology. And the story of Narada is there in the Bhagavatam which says that despite the fact that Narada was born in the womb and learned spiritual lessons while in the womb and came across many, many sages and saintly people and imbibed all their holiness and the lessons of life from there, still a voice came to him to say, "This you will not get your perfection in this life. You require one more life, another life. You see how nature is working from within us and calling us in the same way, telling us, encouraging us. We think nature is our enemy from a biological evolutionary point of view, that it's struggle, survival of the fittest, bite and scr scratch and fight, and you'll get a selective species that will continue. And all of that sub struggle, struggle and survival for the fittest Natural selection, where does it come from? It just appears without explanation. No, there's an explanation. There's an internal drive from within. And this is what religion calls imminent God. And so, higher and higher through various bodies, till his last glory came back and he remembered his own nature. Then the kind mother, not the fighting, biting, scratching, crude, nature rending claw and tooth but the kind mother went back the same way she came for others who also have lost their way in the trackless desert of life and thus is she working without beginning and without end not a linear thing without beginning without end and thus through pleasure and pain through good and evil the infinite river of souls is flowing into the ocean of perfection of self-realization. Then he ends off with a prayer. Glory unto those who have realized their own nature. May their blessings be on us all. What a beautiful way of thinking 
that there is this natural evolutionary thrust that is Mother Nature herself. And so in these last few stanzas, this is emphasized, the positive aspect of this flowing river, as it were, of souls bring forth, forth of which you are I, are some, as it were. And so what happens when he's born, when a soul is born into this new environment? Tatratam bhuti sam yogam labate porva dehi kam yatate chatato bhuya sam sithao kuro dandaha. There he regains the knowledge, he remembers. The self forgetting entity remembers. What does he remember? All the knowledge acquired in his former body. And he strives more than before for perfection. O oh, joy of the Kurus. You get a better start. What a wonderful, loving nature this is. Of course, there are individual exceptions. For example, Swami Vivekananda, Sri Ramakrishna, they were perfect yogis, born solely for the salvation of mankind. Some are like that. They are exempt, as it were, from karma because the thrust that brings them into the world is purely to affect everybody for the next few thousand years or so and more by virtue of them being huge wave that comes onto the scene from time to time to correct the dharma, as it were. And we find that also later in this Bhagavad Gita, that this Adharma being registered, Mother Nature, as it were, expresses itself and gives birth. You see that beautiful Christian prayer, without knowing, knowing it usually, tells us, Hail Mary, say the Catholics here. Hail Mary, salutations to Mother, who art the Mother of the universe, full of grace, abundant grace and love spreading everywhere. Holy, uh, uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. That is, the divine is there with you, through you, in you, expressing. Blessed are you among all female forms. The mother of the universe is the mother of all female forms. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And they say, Jesus, that is, blessed is the womb that gave birth to an incarnation. See, this philosophy comes out even in this prayer. Then, by that very form of practice, he is led on in spite of himself. By that very form of practice, he is led on in spite of himself. A very interesting term. In spite of himself, we are our own worst enemy. This we were told also in this very chapter. You are your own best friend or your own worst enemy. So in spite of yourself, in spite of all the, of you thwarting everything, in spite of that, still that inward evolutionary thrust is there. Still the mother nurtures and pushes you forward. Even, in, even he who merely wishes to know yoga rises superior to the performer of Vedic rites, you might say, religious ritualistic rites. Why? Because there's a motive in it. Prayatnyat Manastu Yogi Sam Shodha Kilbishaha Anika Janma Sam Shidas Tatoyati Param Gatim. The yogi who strives with great assiduity, great determination, 
purified from blemishes and perfected through many births. How many birds? Well, we have to take count of how many species there are on the planet. Still there are undiscovered species. If you go to areas in the Amazon and various other places on the planet, you'll find undiscovered species already of insects and other creatures. And not to mention all the fossilized creatures that have gone into extinction. Seven billion humans are now on this planet. And when we think the vastness of everything, how do, we can't stop there at biological evolution. Because where did all that begin? Before all that, biological evolution may be from a small bacterial species arriving, let's say, maybe near four billion years ago. But it's nothing because even in quantity, you'll find how many galaxies there are. We used to think that when we looked out into the sky, we thought that this is the only galaxy. The whole galaxy that we know of today, the Milky Way, is the entire universe. Now we know that this is one of an estimated two trillion galaxies, 200 billion galaxies, as a conservative estimate. And in each one of those galaxies, something like 100 billion stars estimated. I think it was Basil here who mentioned that there was, a, it was something like 94, uh, 94 billion light years, something like that, across the visible universe. Beyond that, we don't know. It's only what is visible to us. And so that is estimated. So, 90, 93 billion light years across, 100 billion stars per galaxy, 2 trillion galaxies, and that's just what we know of. And much of that is just estimated conservatively. We used to think 100 billion galaxies. Now we know, no, it's about 200 billion. You study a small spare spot in the sky, seemingly, some small square inch, the Hubble telescope, looks at that constantly without blinking. And there that reveals another 10, 30, 20, 30 billion galaxies. It's a vast. How did we all get from that to this? It gives us a sense of perspective. And yet, we can't say we're divorced from it. It's all one and the same. So through all of that, evolution came not just the biological evolution. What a glory. On the other hand, all of that observable universe is also in the waking state, <laughs> which brings another perspective here. Sri Krishna gives this commentary. He says, the newborn calf totters and tumbles down several times before learning to frisk about. Similarly, the sadhaka has to struggle much before he meets with success. So we should learn to do that and be patient about it and do our best, best struggle. Yoga being hard to achieve, what's the harm in the ordinary man having recourse to any other ways of accomplishing the desired ends? Well, there are many ways, but not all are yoga and not all will give the same result. So yoga, in fact, is unparalleled. Tapasvi bhyo diko yogi jnani bhyo pi mata dikaha karma karmi pyascha diko yogi tasmad yogi bhavajana The yogi is deemed superior to what? Superior to? Tapas to ascetics who undergo austerities. The Buddha also came across that. People holding their hands up, people fasting, fasting to a skeletal state. And he never found any realization in that. So he moved on and he found a middle way, a practical way, sat down with no map or compass and decided, I will not move from this spot until the truth is revealed to me. That level of determination he had. 
superior to those ascetics. Superior to what? Jnani Pya. Those people of knowledge. That is, those people who value the intellect more than anything else. And he is also superior to ritualists. In every religion you'll find them. Even without religion you'll find them. You ask somebody, you're walking on the street, why didn't you walk under the ladder? <laughs> now if he thinks about it, he might think, well, because a pot of paint might fall on me. But even if there's nobody up the ladder, no pot of paint, still you go around it. Why? Somebody told you in your youth, you shouldn't do it. You know, the great uh, psychologist Thomas Harris quotes uh, E. Byrne. E. Byrne came across this person and developed something called transactional analysis. What happened there? He noticed that in talking to somebody, I've told you this before, he saw somebody who was shrinking physically in his presence and saying, you know, my family treat me in a very bad way. And then he had a transformation and became a kind of parent with a shaking parent finger. You know, the children of should, uh, today should know better and so on and so forth. So he developed this system of transactional analysis where we take on these different aspects within ourselves. Not knowing any better as children, we take it on board. So one case he mentions that there was a lady who couldn't get over a phobia or a certain compulsive behavior she would never put a hat or a coat on a bed or a table. And she developed this because her parents said, you should never do this. Then she wondered, why shouldn't I do it? And the psychologist <coughs> said, go and ask your mother. She's still alive, yeah? Go and ask her. He went and asked her. This big, big thing that was really, she was struggling with a huge, huge difficulty in her head. He went to her mother. You know, when we were children, you forbade us to put a coat or a hat on a bed or a table. Why was that? Oh, that small thing. <laughs> it's a huge thing. Oh, that small thing. Well, because after the World War, all the children in the neighborhood, they had lice in their hair. And so for that reason, we never put these things there. Ah, that whole compulsion dissolved immediately. So this ritualistic aspect, whether you believe in God or not, we all have an aspect of that. That is, unthinking habits, which we have. And we just do it because our parents did it. Why do you light a lamp? My mother did it. Why did she do it? Her mother did it. And your great-grandmother did it. But why? What's the meaning of these? And people should understand that. Not only be taught the ritual, but at some point, this is what it means. When you light a lamp, is it not a symbol of the inner light which is there? That light represents something that removes darkness. That when you light a lamp, and in the old days you had to go to great trouble creating a spark by rubbing sticks with great laborious efforts at friction, create a little spark, and that then was applied to tinder, a small spark, you had to laboriously blow on it. What a treasure fire was, and what a mystery that it came from, two sticks. <clears throat> something inward was there, something mysterious was there. The fire has a deep historical meaning and symbolizes God leading the devotee forward. These kinds of things should we not explain? Get rid of superstition. And so the yogi is deemed superior to all of these, the ritualist, the ascetic, and people of knowledge. Therefore, the exhortation comes, be a yogi, be a yogi. Therefore, the smart Bhava, be a yogi, Arjun. Sri Krishna makes this comment. What is the good of mere book learning? He says. The learned may at best be adepts in aptly and accurately quoting from scriptures. One's lifelong repeating them verbatim effects no change in one's life. But what is told in the scriptures has to be applied to life and improvement brought on it. Scriptural knowledge is of no avail to the one attached to earthly life. A worldly man may be as much informed in religion as the spiritual man, or he may even excel in learning and intelligence. He may even be endowed with rigidity of a yogi's life 
and the detachment of a sannyasi. In the midst of these merits, his life may dwindle into nothing if he utilizes them all, not for the glory of the Lord, but for self-glorification, name, fame, and wealth. In other words, if all of these things have some personal individual motive attached to them, then these are inferior ways. Not to be relegated, not completely useless, but inferior. So who among the yogis is the best one? This is, not, this is better than this. Who's the best? This answer comes. Yoginam api sarvesham madgatena antaratmana shadavan bhajate yomam sami yuttamo nataha And of all the yogis, he who worships me with faith, his inmost self merged in me, him I hold to be the most devout. Of all the yogis, yogis can worship with a sense of doubt. Most many people who pray, pray from a doubtful situation. That's why they have to repeat the prayer. You don't do it at the post office. You post a letter and you leave it. You don't follow up to the postman collect it. Did he put it in the sorting office? If it's a mail, did he carry it on the airplane? Should I accompany him? <laughs> and deliver it myself. No, you post it and leave it. Lord, this is yours, finished, leave it. His inmost self merged in me, no longer feeling that sense of separation. What is Arjun's problem and all of our problem? We feel that separateness, and therefore we feel that everything is individual and separate, either hostile to us, but certain, or friendly to us, but certainly separate from us. When we feel that oneness with that entity, the Lord of the universe, then he will hold to be most devout. Sri Ramakrishna says this, meditate on enlightenment and bliss which are eternal. Then you gain bliss which is everlasting. This bliss is the, in the ordinary man is shrouded in ignorance. As your desire for sense pleasures declines, your devotion to the Lord develops into divine thirst, this yearning, this thirst, we can see characterized most in comparatively modern times in Sri Ramakrishna. And so finally, this is the end of the chapter. As usual, there is this Iti Srimad Bhagavad Gita Supana Yakshatsu Brahma Vidya Yam Yoga Sutra Sri Krishna Arjuna Samyogi so, in the Upanishad of this Bhagavad Gita, knowledge of Brahman, supreme, science of yoga, and dialogue between Sri Krishna and Arjuna. This is the sixth discourse dedicated to Jnana Yoga, Yoga of Meditation. Om Shanti Shanti.